Good morning, church. Some of y'all are happy or, or you're heckling each other, one or the other. Um, so the, the slide is a little misleading because it looks like we're in the same book, but we're in a new book today. So we are in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're, we're, we're putting along, and there's, there's three chapters in this, but we're going to be here for a little bit. I think we'll spend the whole month of June in 2 Thessalonians just because of everything that's in this book. But today we begin the second letter, and some scholars believe that um, this young church is experiencing all this difficulty, not just persecution. And a lot has happened. The persecution has gotten worse. There was a fake letter written to them that was supposedly from Paul that wasn't from him. And it claimed that uh, this person who disguised himself as Paul, basically, in the, later, in the letter, said that they were already in the tribulation. So here's the, the, the Thessalonians. They're, they're anxious for the end times, and they get this letter from someone pretending to be Paul, saying, hey, it's about to be over. You're in the tribulation. It's about to happen. And so Paul is like, no, 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 no. And he hears of this. And it gets worse because there's a group that comes, and they falsely prophesy over the Thessalonians in the midst of tribulation. So they, they're confused. What is going on? What is happening? And who are these other people that are coming to us? And, and, and this, uh, all of this was in the midst of escalated persecution. So they believed it. They're like, gosh, things are getting worse. The, the end is right on our doorstep. And, and so the condition of the church at, at the beginning of this letter, it really is a warning to us. Here's what they're experiencing in a nutshell. False messages inside the church. Not just false uh, messages about end times, but false teachings as well. And now they're having this escalated opposition and persecution. Fake spiritual gifts. Imitating the Holy Spirit when it's not really the Holy Spirit. And then finally, uninformed and false end times warnings. I looked at this and I was like, man, at a very high level, if I could explain where we're at right now as a church and what we're suffering through right now, it's this. We see this happening today. Let's look at it. Thanks to the internet, we see false messages every day. And it's gotten worse. There's people that I grew up and trusted in the faith that I, I'm now seeing some of them fall away. People that I listen to all the time, and I'm just going, what happened? What happened? And, and, and just, our, just to kind of give you an idea of like false end times warnings, we just had our latest rapture prediction with the eclipse and the cicadas coming. So far, we're still here. Cicadas have not wiped out the United States just yet. They have, I think, until the beginning of July. But as of right now, this is where we're at. I listened this week about a major church in California. They claimed angel feathers were falling in their services. And when the feathers were looked at, there was something akin to something you would find at Party City. And we're hearing of glory clouds, gold dust, random gems falling in services, false signs and wonders, things that when investigated are proven false. I literally watched a video of a guy, he took some of the gems that claimed to have fallen in a service and he took them to a jeweler and he said, these things are worthless. And so we are seeing those things today. Our country is turning further away from Christian values. And that battle is happening now right in this generation. And the world seems more unstable and persecution is more widespread than we realize. It just doesn't make the news. And Christians have pointed our attention towards the end of days. As a result, we look outside and we wonder like which seal has broken in, in the book of Revelation because it looks really crazy out here. And there's this similar confusion that we're currently sharing with the Thessalonians. And the lessons in this letter should apply directly to our current situation. Here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying the end times are far from us. We may very well be at the threshold of this documented biblical event, 
But like the Thessalonians, generally we are walking in confusion of it all as we see things happening in our time. We're looking at all the things going, around us, going on around us and we're forgetting the most important thing. So the main contention of the believer and the times we live in is that as events progress, and I'm repeating something I said, I think last week, that as these events progress, what we know from the word will be greater than what we see in the world. So in other words, your eyes are going to see one thing. God is going to be doing a different thing, a better thing, a longer lasting thing. And to the world, it's going to look hopeless. To the believer, it should look like this incredible hope that when we see all these things happening in the earth, we shouldn't be afraid. In a sense, we should be excited, but we should be prepared. We should be awake. Using biblical language here, we should be sober. I sat with a pastor friend of mine at the end of last year who watches the end times a lot. And we sat on a Thursday and... He was so into it at the time that he told me he didn't think we were going to be here that next Monday. And I knew I wasn't going to change his mind. So I looked at him and I said, I hope you're right. Man, I want Jesus to come back this very second. In fact, I wish he would come back before this sermon was done. I don't know how I feel about my ending. So if he comes back, (laughs) it would be great, right? I wish he would come back before the sermon was done, but this exit mentality will not prepare us if we are called to face what is ahead. The exit mentality is is more of like a checking out. It's almost like being a short timer at your job and doing the bare minimum because you know you're about to leave. That's how Christians treat end times with this mentality. So hear me, before I'm looking for a way out, I'm looking for a way forward. And yes, we should watch, but watching for Christ's return, it was never meant to be a replacement of living for Him. We should watch, but it should never replace your daily life with Christ. I would rather be living out the gospel, seeking unity in the faith, my nose in the word, my hope in His return, listening to the Holy Spirit, because I believe that this is the only way we are going to stand in victory over what is coming upon the earth whether in our days or our children's days or our grandchildren's days. We don't know. We should be ready to prepare those around us and ourselves. So if I could say it this way, more than our end times posture is about what we are looking for, it's about who we are looking to. The Thessalonians believed that the rapture was imminent, so some of them just quit working. They kind of got the short-timer attitude, right? They just... Stopped working, and they're like, Jesus is about to return. Why do I need to go to my job? Others had to work harder to support them because they didn't understand the times. And it's quite possible people were losing heart with the persecution and trials, and Christ hadn't returned yet. And we're seeing people losing heart today, but we call it deconstructing. And for some today... It's the utter disappointment in in midst of all the confusion in the church. It's the utter disappointment of finding out what they believed was not the real gospel. I'll give you a picture. I have an acquaintance. Uh, She doesn't attend this church. She's come to me a few times and asked for advice and for help. She currently has doubts about God because she fell into the prosperity gospel and lived that way all her life and in her 50s discovered it was a lie. And she doesn't know what to believe anymore because she's believed it for so many years. She doesn't even trust herself in belief. Our compass through life and even the end times, before it's a person, it's the word. Before it's me, it's the word. Before it's anybody else you listen to or who teaches you, it's the word and the Holy Spirit guiding us to the truth of the word and spiritual maturity. And unfortunately, I'm repeating something I think very foundational, but it must be repeated because what we're looking to today doesn't look like the foundation of who we are, of who we should be. In Luke, Jesus declares this in the synagogue, and he quotes Isaiah when he says it. Here's what he says. 
of who he is and what he's doing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has set me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now listen to me. When we read this passage, this is not just about a physical condition. This is not just about blind people who are physically blind. This is not just about people who are are in prison or, or just people who are oppressed. How does the captive become free? How does the blind receive sight? How do the oppressed obtain liberty? The answer is simple. For everyone, it's the truth. The truth of the word, the truth about Christ and his salvation, the gospel, every miracle recorded in the New Testament. Do you know why Jesus did miracles? First off, to validate who he was at that time so that they would believe him. If they couldn't believe his words, he says, at least believe on the miracles. See that God is working through me and I'm sharing this. But he's revealing to them the kingdom. He's doing it for a reason. Miracles aren't done for miracles' sake. They're done for glory. They're done for, the, for the, the purpose of people understanding who Jesus is, that the gospel is genuine even today when miracles happen. They are revealing the kingdom of God. That is the purpose. God just doesn't want to heal you. We get the opportunity to bring him glory and to point people to the kingdom where there is no sickness, where there is no death, where there is no blindness. And so in this, he's looking at them and saying, all of us who don't know Christ and don't know God, we're the ones that are blind. We're the ones that are captive. We are the ones who need liberty. We are the ones oppressed. And Jesus says, I've come to give you life. The word is Zoe. It means abundant life. You named your kids Zoe. That's a great, that's a great name for a girl, right? But it's abundant life. It's abundant life. And that's all of this that's being revealed as Jesus lives. So hear me. In an age of false teaching, false miracles, false prophets, the only anchor we have is the word of God. The only hope in a world captive in sin, blind to the truth, and oppressed by the enemy, even when we hear from the Holy Spirit, we must test that against the word of God. Scripture says, test the spirits. We have to know whether something given to us is legitimate. The word is your anchor, it is my anchor. It is the only hope in a world captive in sin, blind to the truth, and oppressed by the enemy. It should concern us greatly that as a society and for much of church, we no longer seem to care about the truth. And we live in a generation that no longer believes that truth exists when maybe it's because our generation no longer believes that God exists. The two are interconnected with each other. So what happens is today is we imagine that truth is ours to create rather than something we should discern from God. And that's why we have this thing of moral relativism. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. We are trying to do something that God has already done and said, this is what is true. We're literally saying when we do that, that we are rejecting the truth that he's given to us. Saints, that is scary ground. To imagine that we can read the word of God and say, well, I don't know if I believe this. I don't know if I can believe this. What are you saying? Here's what God says is right. But you know what? I think I'm going to have the final word on what is right. When I pick the part of scripture, man, I, that's dated. We don't do that anymore. That is not what the, that's not how we are called to live. So as we look to what is coming upon the earth, I want you to look at it from the perspective of yourself. 
if what you spent the most time doing, that thing that occupies your heart, if that was your anchor, would whatever that is that you are most invested in, would it hold you together as the world fell apart? I don't know what that answer is for you. Where you spend your most time, where your heart goes the most, what is that anchor in your life? All I know is this, and it's simple, that whatever gets you through your day is what you depend on to get you through life. This is not some principled thing that you, you create in your mind and, oh yeah, God's out there somewhere. Man, what you see in the New Testament, they're holding on to Jesus with everything that they have day by day as they live. This is not principled, this is practical. What am I holding on to in my life? And I think we get the principle right, but when it comes down to the practical, we, we push out truth. And we shouldn't. Whatever gets you through your day will be what you depend on to get you through your life, whether you attend a church gathering or not. So Paul beckons the Thessalonians back to the word because anything else they're going to try to hold on to, it's not going to be enough. It's not going to be enough. So he's telling them, come back to the word and, and, and back to the truth. And this is our desperate need to depend on the word and to still do so today. Have you noticed that we have not outgrown our need for the word? We have not invalidated its truths. We still need the word today. So if you have your Bibles, 2 Thessalonians, this is verse 1 through 4. And everything I just told you will build into the text. So let's look at this. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly and the love of every one of you is for one another. One of you for one another is increasing. Verse 4. Therefore we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. Stop there. So Paul's introduction may seem surface to a casual reader. Oftentimes, when we, read, uh, when we read Paul's letters, people tend to skip past the first few verses because, okay, let's get into the meat of this and what it is. But often what Paul does, he did this in 1 Thessalonians. He does it here. He begins and ends with the grace of God methodically in his letters. You'll see this letter after letter where he does this. But Paul's anchor is the grace of God given to him and the peace that results knowing that Paul himself is at peace with God because of the grace given to him. These two are tied together. And in this case, under persecution, this is grace and peace in a world that is absent of both that they're going to have to draw grace and peace from somewhere because a number of them are dying. They're being thrown into prison. Some of them are just getting sick, what we saw in 1 Thessalonians. There's going to be times in your life where the only peace that you have is from God. And we should never replace being content in our circumstances with being content in Christ. The two are not the same. One is temporary, one is permanent for those who follow Christ, that you can continually find peace in him. And Paul actually sets the foundation of this letter in the beginning, whether we read past it or not, that those who have experienced the grace of God will be given the strength to face the world opposed to him. So Paul begins his letter with this encouragement in Christ. And in Christ alone can they be encouraged right now. He's not telling them that, man, you can do it. Just keep going. He's recognizing that rather than trying to cope with the world, the church should hold fast to Jesus. 
This is not just about you coping as, as hard as you can with your faith. This is about overcoming the world with your faith. Meanwhile, people are looking to the world for answers when there are none. So the Christian's ultimate objective is not peace with the world, but living at peace with God. Make sure you know the difference in your life and how you live. Because otherwise, what will happen is, is when your circumstances are good, you'll have faith. But when life gets difficult, what will happen? Your faith will fall. Because your faith now becomes conditional on the quality of your life, not the quality of your Savior. And it limits the faith that the believer has. If you're unsure about your life right now, be sure in Christ. That's what you should be. There are two other core attributes here that I want to discuss. And he talks in this passage about faith and love. And in this letter, we see the faith of the Thessalonians despite all of this. Their faith is still growing. I want to be real with you today, and this is really like, be careful when you ask God for more faith. We're talking about growing faith, right? Be careful when you ask God for for a, a, a stronger faith. Because you know how I wish he did it? I wish like a faith lightning bolt would zap me on the top of the head and Dave would have more faith, right? Right? But what does he do? He puts you in situations that require you to have more faith to conquer and and, and persevere through them. And so when Paul looks at them and says, you have a faith that's growing, man, sometimes you just say, hey, why don't you keep that to yourself? We don't want to talk about this. I don't know if I'm ready for it. Right? But there's got to be some truth to this. And all the attributes, when we look at them, look at them from the standpoint of times being good and times being difficult. Are you willing to do the work for your faith to grow in your life? Because oftentimes, we, God, it just make me stronger. God, get, make me more patient. Don't do that, man. You're going to be very impatient. <laughs> but, but this is how this works. God uses suffering. God uses difficulty. He uses challenges. God used my mother's poverty in my life as a kid to teach me the value of not being poor so that I don't take for granted the life that God has given my wife and I. And and like, we'll go to spend something. I'll go, man, that's too much money, Michelle. She goes, Dave, stop it, stop it. But I'm always that way because when, guys, I ate dog food when I was a kid. No side effects whatsoever. (laughs) None. We were that poor. But you know what? I value so many different things, and I value people as a result of that. Man, I, I remember Christmases, and I don't even remember the name of the church or the believers, But I remember my mom, when I was six years old, I remember crying, my mom crying because she wasn't going to be able to afford anything for us at Christmas. And as a six-year-old, I didn't even know why she was crying. She told me later. But the church that we were attending that, that year, the night before when we were all asleep, they put a gazillion Christmas presents on our front porch. My mom cried again for a completely different reason. But man, you learn how to value people. You learn how to value what you have and you take care of what you have, especially when you can't just go out and get it again. God uses suffering. He uses suffering. Here is the other part of this too. Is not only is it for our benefit, as we see in this passage, it's for our faith to grow. Warren Wearsby, he says it this way, probably the most simplest way that I've heard it said. A faith that cannot be tested cannot be trusted. So as we consider the maturity of the faith, we have got to be able to to allow ourselves to be tested to make sure that we have a faith that's greater than a circumstance, that's greater than a moment, 
that focuses on Christ and not our well-being to where that we have this solid faith that is both tested and trusted. God uses suffering. And his point makes perfect sense. Believers should expect their faith to be tried. Not to break down a believer, but to build a believer up. And the question in life, do we have the faith to trust God? Because in suffering, you will answer that question. All the scripture you know will come to surface in suffering. We will hold on to promises tightly. We will repent more easily. All of that comes to light in suffering. Nothing illustrates this more to me than Peter walking on the water with Jesus. Because the question is, can we see life through the lens of faith? Can we? So Peter's out on the water, and he has this moment that most of us know. He has this moment where just this singular moment where he looks at the wind and the waves and his fear becomes bigger than his faith. And he begins to sink. This is Peter. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him and sang to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? So Peter is walking on the water. He has the faith to do so. And in one glance of fear, he begins to sink. And so a lot of times we have faith for the moment, but we don't have faith for the difficulty. And when you look at what's going on with Peter right now, at least in this passage, what we see by the book of Acts, God has grown the man's faith. The Spirit of God is inside of him, and he is standing up to leaders. He says, judge for yourselves. Should we listen to you or listen to God? And for Peter to say that is, from this, is amazing. So as the faith of a believer grew, this attribute of love was being perfected in the believer. And you, you may look at this and say that anyone can love, one, love another person. But there is a distinction of the love within a believer in Scripture. The goal of a Christian is not to love more. The goal is to set God's love on display in their lives. I'm not here to love you the way that I love you. I'm here to, to, to seek out how God loves us and that we love each other that way. And it is through faith that this love comes to fruition. The three pillars of faith, faith I'm sorry, the three pillars of the Christian, faith, hope, and love, that they all work together for a reason. It takes more than human nature to love as the Bible calls us to love. It takes something otherworldly to love this way, to love someone who hurts you, who gossips against you, who hates you. And what we see here is that as their faith grew, their love increases because they are approaching the love of God. And as God invaded their hearts, the love they set on display reflected the one who had taken residence within them. There's this transformation happening within them. And Paul takes notice of it. The sad truth is that spiritual maturity is the least experienced principle within a body of believers. We often look at faith like an on-off switch. Like we have faith or we don't have faith. And once we have it, we're good. That's how we look at faith today. You know the Bible doesn't say that? Jesus looks at Peter and he says, you have little faith. It's measured. Jesus tells the centurion that he had great faith. In all of Israel, I had not seen such great faith is what he says. And seeing beyond salvation to maturity is important in your walk with Jesus. And, and I want, I so desperately want us to engage this. Because I, I think that if we understood what this and we acted it out, we wouldn't have the problems we have. As a church, we wouldn't. Hear me on this. Faith and faithfulness 
work hand in hand. You know that it misses the entire point to tell people that you're a Christian and you have faith, but you're absent of faithfulness, right? So you come in on a Sunday and man, man, it's like, man, it was a decent message today. I loved it. It was great. I went back to my house. And I kind of just did what I wanted Monday through Saturday. We have an epidemic of that. We have taken this word faith and we have divided it from this word faithfulness. But do you see how that doesn't make sense? When we live this way, how we talk to the people outside of the faith, the language we use, what we do in front of our phones or our computers, all of those things, faith versus faithfulness. Man, I have faith, but I I don't mind doing these other things. It's not that big of a deal to me. We don't say it that way, but that's what our actions say. We cannot separate faith from faithfulness. They work hand in hand. And I believe it misses the entire point to tell people you have faith, but to be absent of faithfulness. The presence of one produces the other. Let me say it again. The presence of one, faith, produces the other, faithfulness. The presence of faithfulness will produce faith. You don't divide the two from each other. We treat faith like it's some mystical acknowledgement of God that saves us. When we look throughout the New Testament, we see all these people being faithful to the very end because the faith that they held on to drove them in faithfulness. And somehow today we have divided the two from each other and we shouldn't have. To say you put your trust in God yet live like you trust yourself. To say you belong to God but you don't live for Him. At this this point, one begins to negate the other. And herein lies the difficulty of an empty heart. To say you have faith but but you're not faithful to God. What kind of faith is that? Please what I'm, hear what I'm trying to say today. Man, if, if we were sold out for Jesus as capital C church, we wouldn't have the problems in the church that we have today. We would be faithful to the word, faithful to each other, faithful to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We'd be faithful in hope, faithful in affliction, faithful in suffering, faithful in joy. If we had genuine faith, I think it's a modern idea, at least a semi-modern idea that somehow you can have faith without faithfulness. I'm getting to this place where I don't understand how one can be without the other. So Paul ends this section recognizing great faith, that it's producing a steadfastness, this this endurance that they they are, are living with. And what's interesting here is revealed in the Greek The word for steadfastness, this is hupomene. It literally means steadfast endurance. This is more than gritting your teeth through your hard times with your faith. And you, times are hard. It's something more powerful, this idea of steadfastness. Barclay, he's a Greek translator. He says this of steadfast, this word hupomene. He says this. He said, the word describes the spirit which does not only patiently endure the circumstances in which it finds itself, but which matters, but which masters them and uses them to strengthen its own nerve and sinew. It accepts the blows of life, but in accepting them, it transforms them into stepping stones to new achievement. This word for steadfastness, it's steadfast endurance. It's not only are you holding on, you are holding on in strength and you're growing in the midst of it. This word sinew, if you look at the the word, what it is, it's the tissue that joins muscle and bone. It makes the person stronger when it is strong. And so this idea of steadfastness is powerful. But oftentimes what happens is when we're enduring, we, we just settle for holding on. And God is literally calling us to walk in victory. Genuine, spiritual, Christian victory because of what Christ has done on the cross. 
This is the power of the Spirit within every believer. That suffering will defeat the world and yet refine the Christian. And those who are growing in the faith testify to this fact. You know, rarely that God, rarely does God lead us around difficulty. But for the believer who seeks God, he's with us in it and through it. So no matter what you're facing today, I want you to remember this because we need it. We need God. Whether your times are great, whether, you're, whether you have challenges, this type of steadfastness, steadfastness is the invitation not only to endure but to overcome. Amen? Last part, verses 5 through 12. Verse 5 says this. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Verse 6. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. To this end, we always pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. So God doesn't work in us through suffering and in suffering, but there is an evidence in suffering that God is going to judge in other words, the fact that, that Christians do suffer, and if you don't know suffering going, around, going on in the world today, you need to look more at world news than just local news. There are a lot of Christians who suffer still today. In fact, more in the last century than all the other centuries combined is the statistic. So when God's church faces worldly opposition, the world is already demonstrating their coming judgment because the, word is, the world is opposing the will of God. So in other words, what we see in the backdrop of all of this is that there's an evidence for the believer that if the world was just happy with Christianity, that'd be one thing, because the Bible says that the world is going to be judged. In other words, it's natural for the world to oppose God. However, the believer is going through a refining process here. And there's an opposite view of suffering of what most people hold that we've got to consider. What happens when we suffer? You know what our typical thing is? is why is God mad at me? Does he not hear me? Does he not hear me praying to him? Why has he not answered my prayer yet? Doesn't he see what I'm going through? That is typically how the average Christian deals with suffering. Where Paul is trying in this passage and in the, in the next chapters to get us to see the victory from it. That this is a natural step in the plan of God for the victory of the saints through the cross of Christ and the eternal kingdom. But we don't look at suffering this way. The believer is going through a refining process. Listen to what Peter says. He says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Your difficulty, the things that we face in life, the th people we know that are facing things in life. Peter says there's a reason for it. There is a refining that's happening within it. And the result is praise and glory and honor of Jesus. 
that we're going to come out of this understanding why we went through what we went through, whether natural or, or worldly opposition to the faith. A day is going to come when everything that has happened in your life will make sense. And the outcome of your faith and character will be the evidence of God's work upon your life. And for those who turn to Jesus, suffering works for us, not against us. God is with us in trials. His grace and mercy are experienced and confidence builds in the believer who keeps their eyes upon Jesus in storms. And despite what we lose in this life, we have him forever. People who think you work for your salvation looks at, looks at this passage and they look at this wording of being considered worthy of the kingdom of God. And they, they look at that and they say, man, you earn your salvation. But I personally disagree. I think salvation is by grace, through faith, not of your own doing, a gift of God. The person who was shown to be worthy of the kingdom is the person who is proven already saved by enduring. We can't endure alone. We need God for the endurance. For example, the Bible says this, and I was talking to Jay about this on Wednesday. The Bible says this, he who stands firm to the end will be saved. But if I take this sentence and reorder it, it also holds true. He who is saved will stand firm to the end. Don't imagine that you are standing firm for the sake of your salvation. It's because of your salvation that you can stand at all. Please hear me on this. Because what will happen is, is if you hear it the other way, you're going to wake up every day wondering if you are truly saved. You're going to wake up wondering whether or not you're saved. And that's not the intention of this passage. Paul's encouraging the Thessalonians. We do not stand firm to be saved. We can only stand firm because we are. We are not making ourselves worthy, but we are considered worthy because the kingdom of God is already within us and our lives lived merely prove the reality that already exists and that reality is refined even more in maturity. God never designed the gospel by which we could earn its merits, but it's only because of the gospel and the spirit of Christ who empowers us through it that we would ever face the world and overcome. And I believe personally, when I look at scripture, that's how we should read these passages. Repentance and faith. The soul is what we see here, for example. Grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, to the glory of God alone, scripture alone. Those things are foundational to us because that is what is true. Verse 7. It gives us the remedy and, and the end to suffering of believers. And in verse 7, if you have a Bible that you write in, first off, if you don't have a Bible that you write in, set this one aside, put it in a case, and then get a Bible that you can write in so that you can, you can actually come back to this later. But in verse 7, underline these two words, is revealed, if you have the ESV. Is revealed in verse 7. So I'm going to give you a glimpse of what I see. So during the week when I study, this is what I get to see, and it's this. This is, uh, this is from uh, my Bible software. I don't know if you can see it exactly, but I hope you can. Uh, I, I have is revealed highlighted there. This is, for some of you, this is like an eye chart. I know, you're just going A-E. But this word is revealed, see the blue underneath? It's the Greek for apocalypse. It's the Greek for the word apocalypse. And I want you to understand this because if you ask the modern world what, a, what the apocalypse is, the answer is, is that it's the destruction of the, of the universe as in the book of Revelation. That's what the word apocalypse means. But that's more of a recent idea. In fact, in the Greek, it wasn't called the book of Revelation. The last book in the Bible was called the Apocalypse of John. Because this word apocalypse and revelation, they actually mean the same thing. The revealing, the unveiling of Christ. 
Now, is God going to judge the earth? Absolutely. Does that happen when Christ comes? Yes. But that's not what this word apocalypse means. And, and with this, when you see revelation, or when you see apocalypse, literally means the unveiling of Christ. And we've missed the meaning of this word and we've lost it to culture in a sense. The apocalypse biblically is God revealing the Son to the world. That's what apocalypse means. Yes, the world is destroyed in judgment, and it's going to most certainly happen. But understand that the apocalypse is more pointed to the revelation of Jesus, and it should prompt us to see this word differently. Christ, now hear me all the way through on this one before you disagree with me, but here we go. Christ is not primarily coming to destroy the world. He's actually coming to judge it. The distinction is important because Jesus is not acting out violence, even for his own reasons. He's giving the world what it deserves. It's different because what's happened here is God is just looking at people who have rejected him and said this is the judgment for those who have rejected him. He's not coming because he wants to to send every person possible to hell. Whether we completely understand it or not, God wishes for none to perish. John 3.16 is a famous verse, but John 3.17 even reinforces the idea. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. And at the end of time, what's going to happen is God is going to come for His own. And when it comes time for everything that we see in the book of Revelation, which we'll get more into that, I think, next week, When we see this, God is giving people exactly what they wanted, whether they wanted him or not. Sometimes people imagine that God just is, is angry and he's, and he's ready to, to, to kill as many people as possible. But it's not the case. The whole gospel story is a rescue mission from a, a universe, a world totally and utterly and completely lost so that all would be saved who would turn to him. It's not the case. God is is not here to destroy as much as possible. He's here to save as many as possible. And God is merely giving people exactly what they wanted. And for those who know Christ, who depend on Him, who seek Him, they will have Him forever. God is going to give us exactly what we want as believers. But for those not interested, more interested in their own way, they will be apart from Him forever. Do you notice the language in the Gospels, and even here, is the idea of being cast out of the presence of God? In other words, you didn't want my presence. I'm giving you exactly what you wanted. So the language here is an absence of the presence of God. And a person who has no desire for God will not have him. They will never feel his presence in eternity. And Paul then reveals his prayers for the church that we live lives not by our power, but by God's power. All good and every work of faith is through him. And the fact that God is working through us by his power is the reminder that we are only worthy of his calling when we are surrendered to it. Salvation is the precursor. We are not going to prove ourselves worthy of his calling if we are not first called. Our lives show legitimacy in our our faithfulness to His callings. Having faith makes us faithful. If I could put it in simple terms, we cannot separate faith and faithfulness still. All of this, let me bring it together. I believe we've missed the idea of a genuine Christian life. Man, I grew up believing that all I needed to do was have a moment of faith And once I had that moment, I was secure and I could go do what I wanted. That's how I was raised. And it caused me so many problems in life. But the mentality denies the nature of genuine faith. I've met many believers who thought they were saved because they walked an aisle and prayed a prayer and nothing else about their life changed. The problem is, is in the New Testament, if you look at the people who are saved, the picture painted is those of faith striving to the very end against the world. 
even to the place of at the end of the book, John's writing about the return of Jesus. That's how hyper fixated they are on living out the Christian life from salvation to face to face meeting with Jesus. There is a missed premise that I would like to end on in verse 10. So Paul's declaring that growing in faith, increasing in love, enduring suffering, maturing in the faith, living with hope, all of these, all of these things happen in you and through you, which will culminate to the return of Jesus. Throughout this chapter, Paul gives three major aspects of our Christian life. And because I'm crafty, they all start with the letter W so you can remember. First and foremost, live a worthy Christian life. To live a life worthy of the kingdom we are inheriting. If we are a people of faith, we will have faithfulness. And we can live a worthy life through Christ and because of him. We can walk out our faith. This is not just a walk down an aisle. This is a walk from the moment you said you would follow Jesus until the day you see him face to face. God fulfilling his purposes through you and through your faith. And then ultimately what we're we're seeing in Scripture and even in Thessalonians, the idea of being a witness. That Christ will be glorified in his saints. Notice in verse 10 that this word in his saints. The language here could mean through his saints or by his saints or both. But here's the reality. At the return of Jesus, those of us who have been, are alive, if, if any of us in this room were to be alive when Christ returns, we will be living this out and our hearts continually are transformed by the work of the Spirit within us as we walk Uh, as we we live worthy lives, as we are witnesses for Christ. And there comes a time when Christ will return. And in an instant, everything that's within our heart is going to be reflected in who we are to the world. Don't miss the, the beauty of this word in. There is going to be this beautiful moment in the future for those who are alive when all that God has done in us is going to become visible to everyone, even if it's for a moment before we go to be with Him. It's going to be this moment of glory that will lead to an eternity of glory. In 1 Corinthians, Paul declares that that we are going to be changed in an instant. So imagine Jesus coming down and, and in apocalypse, in His revealing, we are instantly changed as visible objects of His glory. This is a little mystical, but stay with me for a second because I think it's true. So it is with the resurrection of the dead, what is sown perishable, what is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. And so what he's saying here is this idea that when Christ does come, this flesh that we carry, that is dying day by day, in a moment, is going to be replaced with a glorified body for those who are dead and those who are alive. And I believe the world is going to get a glimpse and it's going to bring glory to God as we go to be with Him. The text here is important because Paul is pointing the Thessalonian church to the return of Jesus in the midst of their suffering. And for us, I think we take this for granted that what God is doing in our heart matters. But what he's doing in our heart is not going to end there. It's going to be every part of who we are. Physically, emotionally, spiritually is what's going to happen. It's almost like as the seed dies, the the plant raises. And we're going to see who we truly are when this is all said and done. And for the Thessalonians, this was hope. This was hope in the midst of suffering, in the midst of loss. So as we consider our lives, Christ will be glorified in us. In us. So we live in practice now, and even in principle now, will be perfected when Christ returns. 
And all of this, everything that you're doing in your life, everything that you're suffering, even the things that you don't understand, there's a reason. And it, there's going to be a day when we fully understand everything that God has done in us. And we will be changed. This future reality should encourage every one of us in our battles that we face today. And as we bring glory to God, faith and glory work together for this moment. Glorifying God by demonstrating faith, it's not doing ultimately. Glory is literally making visible what God has already done in us. That's what glory is. Please, see the hope and the warning in this chapter. There is no gray area in Paul's mind. We will either live, a, live out a genuine faith, walking by a spirit, knowing God and obeying Him, walking in His grace when we fall short, or we will live the way we want. John Stott makes his chilling declaration, a summary from both books. Heaven, is to be, heaven, the idea of it, is to be with the Lord forever. Hell is to be excluded from the Lord forever. And those apart from Christ will be cast from His presence. And the word that is continually used is outer darkness. And those apart from Him that don't follow Him, obey Him. And all I say of this to you in order that you would flee from what is coming and turn to Jesus. Don't settle for a faithless faith. Please. I know it's common. I know that's like, like the norm in American culture. But do not settle for a faithless faith. You would have to ignore everything that's being said in this passage to do so. The posture of faith is not merely believing that God exists. It's living with Him as your Savior. And when Christ comes, He's going to judge us all, but for the believer, our judgment was at Calvary. And Christ took on the penalty for all of our sins. And we're forgiven. But for those without Jesus, they will be guilty for a holy God, before a holy God. Man, what is the premise today? What does it take to get into heaven? Ah, do good stuff, be a good person. Can I tell you something? Just to make sure you're not there. No matter how hard you try to be a good person, imagine standing before a flawless, holy God of light and trying to look at him and say, you know what? You are marvelous, but man, I was good enough. That is scary. And there are so many people that are settling for that for their eternity now. It, it's the answer that's given again and again. If I'm just good to people, if I do good stuff, they're going to stand before a holy and righteous, pure God and say, man, I was good enough. That scares the mess out of me for anyone. I would not want anyone to have that wake-up call when it was too late. Let me ask you something. And here's where I'll end. Is Paul telling the Thessalonians to live out a casual faith? Or is he telling them to remain steadfast, to increase in love, to live a life dependent on God and a life worthy of the calling given to them? Let me ask you this. Is this how we approach our faith today? If I have bored you to death and you never come back, I still want you to hear this. Don't settle for a faith without faithfulness. Don't settle for a Christian walk without walking. Please. God is going to look at the quality of your faith. It is not an on-off switch. It is little faith. It is great faith. It is measured and you're not working for your salvation, you're working from it. You have to have the salvation to even stand. Please hear me. 
Because I don't want you to have that moment where you face God. And I went to church a few times. I was a good person. I, I, I did what I thought was right. And you see his pureness and his holiness. And you're overwhelmed by, by who he is. And you go, man, my life was a sham. My life was a sham. I, I should have fallen on my knees before a holy God and depended on him for all life. I should have lived for him. I don't want you to have that regret. You see, time is short. The mission is ours to live out. The maturing of our faith should be a continuing desire. Our devotion to God and to each other is the invitation. And bringing him glory is, is our agenda. The purpose of the apocalypse, the unveiling of Jesus, is the culmination of everything the believer should be living for now. That when Christ comes, it is all going to be made right in our lives and we should live with that kind of hope. Here's my perspective moment. If you were face to face with God, what do you think he would say that you lived for? If today was your last day on this earth, what would he say you lived for? And would you like his answer if he answered the question for you? Because ultimately as Christians, we should live for Christ. And maybe, just maybe, it's time to let go of these things that don't matter, temporary pursuits, unforgiveness, idleness, apathy, gossip, distraction. The hope today is simply that we would decide to be intentional about glory, that our faith would yield faithfulness. He's coming back. Do you believe that? Do you believe he's coming back? And using Paul's words here, may we be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. Will you pray with me? God, as we look at 2 Thessalonians, we look at the first chapter. God, my prayer today is for all of us that we would seek you like we've never sought you before. God, that not only would we be serious about salvation, God, we would be serious about faithfulness. God, I'm going to pray the dangerous prayer. Give us more faith. Make our faith stronger. Help us to be people of faith, full of faithfulness, dependent on your grace for our shortcomings, living for your name and for your glory. Let us set aside the distractions because the day is going to come when you do come back and we're going to see you, whether we leave the bodies we are in now or whether you come and return before we die. I believe you're coming back and God, we should live like that soon coming meeting matters. Lord, we offer this up to you for your name and for your glory. And as we take communion today, as, as we break the bread and as we drink the cup, that we're reminded of the, the, the body that was broken and the blood that was shed. God, let us live like that matters. And ultimately, God, when you come back, that we would, we would be willing to, to, to look at you in the face, knowing that we depended on you for everything, that we didn't run from the call upon our lives. If anyone is in here and they've asked for the forgiveness of sin, they're welcome to take communion with us. And Lord, we give this day to you in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, you're dismissed. Thank you.